And here we are, the new studio, and it took a lot of work and a lot of effort, but we finally got here, and with this new studio fully set up and the staff that I have, I can make about five or six videos on this channel every month and daily uploads on the second channel. And I can use my comedy as a Trojan horse into your children's minds and radicalise them into fascism. Or we could just talk about mad lads. And to celebrate the new studio, we are going to start off with a big one. A man who doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. He was trodden on by the state, so he decided to tread on them. His reign of terror had police all over the country cowering in fear. And some might say that he was the original Iron Man. Ned Kelly. a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get into the mad lad, a big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for the creative and the curious to develop new skills or refine old skills with new techniques. I've been taking the course Indoor Gardening, Grow Houseplants, Veggies and Herbs by Ekta Chowdhury. I like the tips that she gives to get started on growing food as they are very easy to understand and it lets you hit the ground running. Growing your own crops is always very handy knowledge for when society inevitably breaks down. There are no advertisements so you can just focus on learning and whether you are just getting into something or you're already a master, there's always something new to learn with classes for all skill levels. You can try out live classes where you can connect with your teachers and work alongside other members and you can connect and support other creatives in the Skillshare community for encouragement and inspiration. The first 1000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a 1 month free trial of Skillshare. So you can start exploring your creativity today. New sponsor. Show them some love. Click the link. Edward Ned Kelly was born in June 1855 at Beveridge in the colony of Victoria, Australia, as the eldest son of eight children born to John Red Kelly and his wife Ellen. Ned's father was born in 1820 in Clonbrogan, Tipperary in Ireland, and when he was 20 years old, he was sentenced to seven years transportation for stealing two pigs. And what that means is that, like many other convicted criminals back then, he was exiled and sent to Australia. He arrived in Van Diemen's Land, now known as Tasmania, and served his sentence until 1848. After he had served his time, he went to the Port Phillip district where he met Ellen Quinn, who he later married on the 18th of November, 1850, at St. Francis Church in Melbourne. They had five daughters and three sons. John tried his best to provide for his family, but luck was never on his side. As the gold rush came to an end and the town of Beveridge, which was near their farm, became a ghost town. As a result, John struggled greatly with putting food on the table and turned to alcohol to cope. Because Irish. The family then moved to Avenue, where Ned went to school in between his adventures in the nearby bush. Although the latter is where he ended up gaining his most meaningful education. At the age of 10, his heroic tendencies began to manifest as he put himself in great danger to save a seven-year-old boy called Richard Shelton from drowning in Hugh Creek. He had fallen in while trying to retrieve his hat. Because of his selfless action and bravery, Ned was rewarded with a silk green sash by Richard's father, S. O. Shelton. This sash would become one of Ned's most prized possessions 
as it was a reminder of his courage. John Kelly had spent years trying to care for his family within the law, but the authorities in Avenal really didn't make this easy because of John's status as a convict and his family's status as selectors who were settlers that had claimed land that was given to them by the Crown. Tensions were high in Victoria due to the fact that a lot of selectors' land had also been claimed by much wealthier squatters and the more recent immigrants were Irish Catholics rather than the original English Protestant settlers. As a result, the police, backed up by these wealthy squatters, would often harass John's family. Eventually, in 1865, John Red Kelly was caught with meat from a cow that didn't belong to him that he had killed and butchered. And because he wouldn't have done that if he could have just afforded to buy food for his family in the first place, he couldn't afford the fine he was given, so he was sentenced to six months of hard labour at Kilmore Jail. As the eldest son, Ned became the man of the house and stepped up to provide for his family in his father's stead, dropping out of school to do so. John later returned from his sentence as a broken man who was reduced to an abusive alcoholic with a very short temper, and he died of an edema caused by his excessive drinking on the 26th of December 1866 when Ned was only 12 years old. A while after his father's Irish exit, Ned, his mother and the rest of the children moved to a hut at 11 Mile Creek, about halfway between Greta and Glenrowan in northern Victoria. They moved in with their grandfather, James Quinn, who had taken up a cattle run of about 25,000 acres of pretty poor quality land. The Quinns and two Lloyd brothers who had married into the Quinn family were very well known in the area for all the wrong reasons. They were suspected by the police to be in connection with a series of horse and cattle thefts. And growing up with such people didn't set a very good example for Ned. In 1869, Ned met one of his biggest influences that finally pushed him over the edge into lawlessness. A notorious bushranger named Harry Power. A bushranger was a thief that lived out in the Australian bush. Bushrangers often stole from banks or robbed coaches, and most of them were petty criminals and thieves. But some of them were really good at what they did, such as Harry Power. Harry Power was very well known for his robberies and for acting like a gentleman while he did it. Despite having carried out about 600 robberies in a single year, he was rarely violent and had never killed any of his victims or even any of the police that were trying to catch him. Upon meeting Power, Ned became enamoured with the bushranger lifestyle and he tagged along with Power as his apprentice, helping to steal horses and rob people. In return, over the next few months, Power taught Ned everything that he needed to know about bushranging and a sort of hunt for the wilder people type of dynamic. Young Ned would be arrested multiple times over the coming years. The first, when he was just 14 years old for an alleged assault on a Chinese farmer. He was held for 10 days on remand before the charges were dropped, as Ned maintained that he was defending his sister Annie from being attacked by the farmer, and his sister corroborated this story. After this episode, Ned would eventually be held for seven weeks for being a suspected accomplice of Harry Power, but these charges were also dropped due to a lack of evidence, and Ned also got away with it because he couldn't be positively identified, because witnesses had described Power's accomplice as mixed race. Mixed race? Ned had Irish parents. He was probably the whitest man in the entire country. So how the hell did that happen? Well, when you are on the run and living in the bush, you don't really get many chances for a bath. And most bush rangers just went unwashed. 
Ned was so dirty that his skin looked darker to the witnesses, so they thought he was mixed race. But despite getting away with his apprenticeship with Harry Power, Ned wasn't out of the woods just yet. Power had recently been captured by the police, and this capture coincided with Ned's release. So this led to rumours that Power was captured because Ned had snitched. Ned became a bit of a pariah as he vigorously denied the rumour, eventually writing a letter to Sergeant James Babington to ask for help with clearing his name. It turned out that the rat was Ned's uncle, Jack Lloyd, who had sold out Power for £500, which is just over £61,000 today. Ned's luck with the law ran out when he needed to do some errands, and he found a horse on his family farm, and he decided to borrow the horse so he could go out and do his errands. It turned out that this horse had been left on the farm by a man called Isaiah Wildright. And it also turned out that this horse was stolen. A police officer saw Ned riding the stolen horse and went to arrest him. Ned was very confused because he had not stolen any horse, yet the cop kept trying to arrest him. So Ned did what any reasonable man would do and started beating the crap out of the cop. <laughs> and uh, and du during the fight, the cop actually tried to shoot Ned, but the cop's gun misfired three times. It took seven bystanders to get Ned under control, and the cop then decided to use the other end of his gun and pistol whip Ned several times in the face. The scuffle earned Ned three years in Pentridge Prison at the age of 16, which was a lot less than the sentence he was going to get until an investigation discovered that he really didn't steal the horse, because at the time that the horse was originally stolen, Ned was in jail for his association to Harry Power. Meanwhile, Isaiah Wright, who had actually stolen the horse, only got 18 months. He only got half the sentence that Ned did. Although, to be fair, Ned did beat up a cop. Ned was released six months early for good behaviour on the 2nd of February, 1874. Once he was released, he found out that his mother had remarried to an American man called George King, who was a horse thief that was only six years older than Ned. Seems she had a type. Despite her second marriage, though, Ellen continued to be known as Mrs. Kelly. With Ned being just fresh out of prison and being very short on money, he started to take part in bare-knuckle boxing at the Imperial Hotel in Beechworth, which was located right near the border of New South Wales and Victoria. It turned out that bare-knuckle boxing would be something that Ned had a natural talent for, and during one of the fights, he went up against Isaiah Wildright, who had gotten Ned arrested for the whole horse tobacco. Ned did not waste this opportunity for revenge, and he defeated Wright in 20 rounds. Apparently, there were no hard feelings after Ned got even, because Wright later went on to become an associate of Ned's future gang. Sometime later, in 1873, Ned's younger brother James was sentenced to five years imprisonment for cattle theft. At this time, Ned had been working as a lumberjack for two years until he joined his stepfather in stealing horses. Ned's younger brother James was eventually released and went to a place called Wagga Wagga. Fucking Fraggle Rock names. Where he was sentenced again to ten years imprisonment for stealing horses. After the long double jail sentences, James lived his life respectably from then on. But he was alone in this as the rest of the family continued with their crimes of stealing horses and cattle. In mid-1877, after an arrest for trespassing while drunk, Ned got into a scuffle with some policemen again as he tried to escape. 
one of the arresting constables named Thomas Lonigan grabbed Ned by the testicles and squeezed. Eventually, after some talking down by a nearby miller who also gave the police a scolding for their behaviour because, you know, you just don't grab a man's balls during a fight, Ned gave up and was fined three pounds and one shilling by the arresting officers. And allegedly, after this incident, Ned turned to Lonigan and said, Well, Lonigan, I never shot a man yet, but if I ever do, so help me God, you'll be the first. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. As you would probably expect from this laundry list of criminal charges, the Kelly family did not have a good relationship with the police. They saw themselves as victims of police persecution since they were poor and they felt that they were just trying to get by. Some of the persecution was unwarranted and some of it was warranted as the Kelly boys were very clearly involved in the district's notorious organised horse and cattle thefts. It is also not too hard to imagine that the police at this time thought that the Kelly family were a huge thorn on their side because they were constantly committing crimes. Naturally, the police would have gotten a bit of a chip on their shoulders and wanted to make the Kellys' lives hell, either because they wanted to harass them to the point where they gave up and started obeying the law, or simply just to spite them. Despite being surrounded by a lot of seasoned criminals, young Ned was the tamest of the bunch. I mean, he committed crimes, sure, you know, a, a rustled cow here, a stolen horse there, but nothing too serious, which kept him relatively low on the police's radar. But all of that was about to change. An event would occur that would lead Ned Kelly down a path that would make him one of the most famous and notorious criminals in Australian history. Ned's brother Dan had the police looking for him for yet another horse theft. A police trooper named Alexander Fitzpatrick went to Mrs Kelly's home without a warrant on the 15th of April 1878 to try to find and arrest Dan. No one knows exactly what happened in the house, except that a fight broke out. Fitzpatrick claimed that while he was questioning Mrs Kelly, Ned flew into a rage and started beating him. Ned then grabbed a gun and shot Fitzpatrick, hitting him in the wrist. And then Mrs Kelly smashed Fitzpatrick over the head with a shovel knocking him unconscious. After he regained consciousness, Fitzpatrick claimed that Ned had forced him to extract the bullet so that it may not be used as evidence against him. And Fitzpatrick was only allowed to leave the building after promising not to make any reports against Ned or the rest of the family. Though, a report was made anyway. Ned repeatedly denied the incident and claimed that he wasn't even there saying that he was 200 miles away. Some believed that Fitzpatrick inflicted the gunshot wound on himself since he was shot in a very survivable area and the bullet magically disappeared so that it couldn't be identified as coming from his own firearm. Although three policemen later testified that Ned had confessed all of this to them, it's very possible that either party could be lying. Ned was quoted as saying, Fitzpatrick left and invented some scheme to say that I shot him, which any man could see was false. Would I have fired in a house full of women and children when I had a pair of arms with a bunch of five on the end of them? Fitzpatrick knew the weight of one of the pair only too well as it ran against him once in Benalia and he is very subject to fainting. What I think happened, personally, as Fitzpatrick barged his way into their home without a warrant and was acting really arrogant and really rude, treating Mrs Kelly like scum. So, he was acting like a cop. And during his questioning of Mrs Kelly, he was belittling her, mocking her, threatening her and all manner of other things. Ned was watching this man treat his mother like this and felt a rage building up inside him. Maybe it 
got to the point where the cop got so annoyed at Mrs. Kelly for not cooperating that he started yelling in her face or possibly grabbed her. And it was at this point that Ned just snapped and did what any good son would do when he sees a man treating his mother like this and started beating the shit out of him. Ned kicked Fitzpatrick's head in and threw him out of the house. Fitzpatrick, feeling very embarrassed that he just got his arse handed to him by young Ned, wanted revenge on Ned and his mother and a simple assault on an officer charge wouldn't be enough to satisfy Fitzpatrick's vengeance. So Fitzpatrick makes up a whole bullshit story and inflicts a bullet wound on himself so that Ned and his mother can be charged with the attempted murder of a police officer. At least, that's my theory for what really happened. And we might never learn the truth since Fitzpatrick wanted revenge on Ned and Ned didn't want to go to jail. So it was in both parties' interests to lie about what happened. Either way, after the incident, Ned knew that Fitzpatrick would be back with a lot of cops. So Ned fled the scene. Following the incident, Mrs. Kelly, her son-in-law, William Skillion, William Skillion? <laughs> William Skillion, what a name. And a neighbour were <laughs> and a neighbour were arrested and charged with aiding and abetting the attempted murder of Fitzpatrick, and in October of that year, they were tried and convicted at Beechworth. The judge, Sir Redmond Barry, sentenced Mrs Kelly to imprisonment for three years, and the other two men for six years. Rewards of £100 were offered for the apprehension of Ned and Dan Kelly, because they had both gone on the run. But unlike the £500 that Ned's uncle earned for ratting out Harry Power, this bounty would not be easy money. Ned's entire life had prepared him for this moment. He had a set of skills that were perfect for hiding from the cops, and he knew just the right place. The bush. Ned and Dan hid in the Wombat Ranges near Mansfield and were eventually joined by two of Ned's friends, Joe Byrne from Beechworth and Steve Hart, who was a horseman from Wangaratta. The Kelly gang had formed, led by the bush ranger that was destined to become a legend. And after Ned had heard about what happened to his mother, he snapped. And you can't really blame him. Even people that didn't like the Kellys thought that her sentence was too harsh. But nevertheless, the die had been cast. The cops had messed with the wrong mummy's boy. And Ned Kelly set out to get his revenge on the state. It wasn't long before Sergeant Kennedy and Constables Lonigan, Scanlon and McIntyre set out to find and capture Ned and Dan. And on the 25th of October 1878, the cops set up a camp at Stringy Bark Creek. And it was here that one of the policemen made the fatal mistake of shooting some parrots for dinner. The Kelly gang was actually nearby and heard the gunshots. The next day, in the early hours of the morning, Constables Kennedy and Scanlon went out on patrol, leaving Lonigan and McIntyre at the camp. The Kelly gang ambushed the camp, and as soon as Ned saw Lonigan the ball grabber draw his revolver, Ned fulfilled his own prophecy and shot him dead. McIntyre shit his pants and smartly surrendered, but when Kennedy and Scanlon returned to the camp, they refused to surrender when called on. A shootout then ensued that resulted in Ned killing Scanlon and mortally wounding Kennedy. Ned later shot Kennedy in the heart, not out of malice, but out of mercy. While the fighting was going on, McIntyre had managed to escape and headed to Mansfield to report the killings. So on the 15th of November, the Victorian government declared the Kelly gang outlaws and offered rewards of £500 for each member of the gang, dead or alive. Police were 
mobilised, but their methods of pursuit and of obtaining information about the gang's whereabouts were severely lacking in the bush. And they were constantly getting finessed by the intrepid outlaws who were much better trained for that kind of environment than the cops were. The Kelly gang started committing many robberies in small rural towns around this time because gangs need money and you aren't really outlaws if you don't do robberies. But despite these robberies though, the people in these towns would become sympathisers for the gang because they could relate to Ned Kelly's poor and working class background and they also empathised with him for what the cops did to his mother. They saw him as a man of the people fighting against the state. As the Kelly gang's fame grew, the townsfolk's sympathy for their new working class heroes gradually evolved into outright support. They would actually help them out in small ways by looking out for the police or misdirecting the police when they were on the right trail of finding the gang. Others would begrudgingly help the gang for fear of reprisals because despite most people knowing that Ned meant them no harm, the gang wouldn't exactly take no for an answer. After all, you can be as polite as you want, but you're not much of an outlaw if you just respond with understandable, have a nice day, whenever someone doesn't want to cooperate. People would talk, however, and Ned would be spotted by many people during this time. Whether the sightings of him were true or not, none of the authorities seemed to be able to successfully track him. Ned had become a legendary figure, and while that may sound like it should have made tracking him down a lot easier, it actually made it a lot harder, because it's hard to track the whereabouts of someone whose name is constantly being spoken in towns all over the place. A newspaper at the time said that Ned was seen trying to check into a hotel late at night with women of bad repute and he was turned away. The owner of a hotel that Ned apparently sometimes stayed at said that Ned would always be gone by the time they woke up, and a store owner noted that Ned would regularly make purchases at his general store. He only remembered this because Ned would only come into the store after dark, which the store owner found really odd until he realised who this customer was. On the 9th of December, 1878, the Kelly gang held up a sheep station at Faithful's Creek, about four miles outside of Euroa. Ned assured the people inside that they had nothing to fear and that no violence would come to them. He only asked for food for his gang and their horses and a place to rest. One of the employees, a woman named Fitzgerald, said that after Ned had announced his presence, she noticed that Ned had his revolver out and that he meant business. So, she responded with, Well, of course, if the gentlemen want any refreshments, then they must have it. The gang then took 20 station employees captive by locking them in a storeroom, telling them that they would be safe and that no harm would come to them, as long as they played ball. A man named Macaulay was just on his way into the station and he was held up at gunpoint by the Kelly gang, who told him to dismount from his horse. At first, Macaulay offered some resistance, asking what good it would do for them to hold up the station and saying that the station didn't have any better horses than what the gang already had. Ned then came outside and assured Macaulay that they weren't there to steal anything, they just wanted food and a place to rest. Macaulay then thinks to himself, holy shit, that's Ned Kelly. <laughs> so he quickly did what he was told and dismounted from his horse and came into the station. Macaulay's resistance, however, had bought him a little more freedom than the employees because he was allowed to sit with the gang, although they did keep a very close eye on him. Miss Fitzgerald had cooked their food, but the gang asked some of the captives to taste it, fearing that it might be poisoned. All in all, this seemed like a rather pleasant hold-up. The hostages were treated well, and the demands were as close to reasonable as you can get for an outlaw gang. 
the hostages essentially got to have a fun sleepover with Ned Kelly. After they had eaten, Byrne guarded the captives and the other three gang members went to Euroa where they held up the National Bank, taking £2,000 in notes and gold and again they had a grand old time with the bank clerk chatting away with him and his wife over some whiskey because Ned just liked doing friendly robberies. <laughs> The gang members returned to the sheep station with their loot, the hostages were freed without incident, and they once again disappeared into the bush. Obviously, as with all other Ned Kelly coverage at the time, the story of this bizarre event would become widespread, and events like these became very common occurrences. After all, Ned had no quarrel with the clerks or farmhands who were just trying to make an honest living. It just so happens that a man's got to eat and since he couldn't live off of Tahitian mangoes, he had to get his lunch money from somewhere. But the authorities, on the other hand, well, they could get shafted as far as Ned was concerned. And the cops never did themselves any favours with public perception. But it wasn't just the Kelly gang that was taking risks throughout their adventures. In January of 1879, 23 sympathisers that had helped the Kelly gang throughout their exploits were arrested, which resulted in a major backlash against the police. After being held for three months without charge, they were released. And I mean that in the literal sense. They weren't taken home or given any money to pay for the return journey. They were just released. Their cells were unlocked and the cops just went, off you go leaving some of them to travel as far as 50 miles on foot back home in 19th century Australia, where everything in its mum is out to kill you if the sun and heat stroke and dehydration doesn't get you first. This was so messed up, such a messed up thing to do, that instead of setting an example of what will happen to you if you aid and abet the Kelly gang, this instead just made everyone hate the cops even more and actually created more support for the Kelly gang. As you would expect, the cops really didn't take too kindly to the Kelly gang holding up the sheep station, taking a couple dozen hostages and then robbing a bank all in the space of a couple of days. So the reward on each of the gang members' heads had been doubled. But... This didn't stop them because the intrepid bush rangers were still on top of their game, hiding out in the bush like the predator. Then, on Saturday the 8th of February, 1879, the gang happened upon Geraldiri, a town about 30 miles north of the Murray River, when they noticed that the town had everything a gang of outlaws could hope for. A bank and a notable lack of police. It's free real estate. Despite the lack of police presence in the town, the gang needed to be smart about this robbery to avoid the cops calling for backup. But luckily, Ned had a cunning plan. At around midnight, he snuck around to the police barracks and called out for help, saying that there was a drunken fight going on down at the local pub. Smart lie, very plausible because Australia. Immediately convinced, the only two cops in the town ran outside of the station, where the Kelly gang were waiting with their guns drawn. They locked up the policemen, took their uniforms, and impersonated the cops until Monday morning. And despite playing dress up as the very people that they hated the most, the Kelly gang really committed. Dan and Steve carried out all of the standard Sunday police work while Ned kept up appearances by taking the wife of one of the policemen to mass so that no one would suspect something was up. While still wearing the police uniforms, the Kelly gang held up the Bank of New South Wales for £2,141 in notes and coins after rounding up the cops and 60 people in the Royal Hotel next door. And 
While they were at it, the gang carried out their own good deed for the day by burning the town's mortgage documents, freeing all of the locals from debt. The gang also burned telegrams and cut telegraph wires to slow down the law calling for backup and make their escape easier. But Ned wasn't done yet. As he looked at all of the hostages sitting before him, he knew that he had to send a message. So he started talking, sharing his life story and perspective with everyone in the room over some drinks. Over the course of the afternoon, Ned gradually won over the crowd with his charisma and ability to spin a good yarn. He captivated his audience with the spirit of Irish rebellion as he railed against the police, the government, the treatment of Irish convicts and the British Empire itself reiterating his desire for vengeance for not just himself, but for all of the poor selectors and Australia's downtrodden. Ned's popularity was higher than ever, and he had become more than a lovable rogue on a quest to stick it to the man. He was now an icon, and was fighting for a whole lot more than his own family's freedom. As the Kelly gang left the town, Ned left behind an 8,000 word letter that was 56 pages long for publication in the local newsletter. This letter, which became known as the Cameron Letter or the Gerald Deary Letter, was a sort of combination of an autobiography and a manifesto, which echoed the sentiments and ambitions that he had shared with the enamoured crowd in the hotel. And the last sentence reads, I am a widow's son, outlawed and my orders must be obeyed. Obviously, the government censored the absolute crap out of this letter even harder than the UK government censors jokes because they didn't want a rallying cry for revolution spreading among the populace. And it's a bit embarrassing for the government to be told, respect my authority by a criminal. Only snippets and synopses were published until 1930 when the letter was finally released in full. This nice little tidbit for the gang's rap sheet resulted in Ned's bounty being increased to £8,000, which was the highest bounty that any bushranger had ever received. Efforts to bring down the gang were ramped up and the black trackers were brought in from Queensland. Now that sounds like a badass name for a group of bounty hunters. The Black Trackers. That makes them sound like some spec ops secret unit that are only called in for super tactical operations. But in reality, they were called the Black Trackers because they were Aboriginal. Different times. But why send in the big boys from Queensland when this was a Victoria problem? Well, the local Aboriginals wouldn't cooperate. Why? Well, it's because the Australian government from the 1800s asked the Aboriginals to help them bring down a guy that was trying to overthrow them. I don't need to elaborate further. You know exactly how that went. As usual, the Kelly gang then disappeared into the bush for a while where no one could track them down. In fact, they evaded the cops for so long that the piece of legislation that made them outlaws had expired. So most of their arrest warrants were now void. But one arrest warrant remained valid, and that was the warrant for Ned and Dan for the attempted murder of Fitzpatrick. Joe Byrne later found out that his friend and associate of the gang, Aaron Sherritt, had become an informant for the police, as the power of money seemed to be more important than the power of friendship. So on the 26th of June, 1880, Joe paid Sherritt a little visit at his residence near Beechworth and shot him dead in his own doorway. The four constables who were assigned to guard Sherritt were bravely hiding in his bedroom, later citing that they had no confidence in any of his information anyway. If that was true, then why were you guarding him? 
what really happened is the Kelly gang turned up and you all shit yourself and ran away and hid in the bedroom like a bunch of little fairies. Burn and Dan then met up with Ned and Steve at Glen Rowan on the following Sunday. And while here, they took about 60 people as captive in a hotel called the Glen Rowan Inn. At this point, it became clear that the murder of Sherritt wasn't just a case of exterminating a rat, it was a publicity stunt. Ned was counting on the murder, resulting in the authorities loading half of Victoria's cops onto a train from the town of Benalia in Melbourne to come out into the bush and take him down. Now, why would Ned want to cause something like that on purpose? Well, it's because Ned wanted to take the fight to them. And, of course, no outlaw gang story is complete without a big moment involving a train. The Kelly gang intended to cripple the authorities by derailing the train and killing any survivors from atop a hill, which would allow them to just rock up to the soon-to-be unpoliced town of Benalia and rob the banks and destroy the government buildings. They threatened two local railway workers to tear up some of the tracks and while waiting for the train, the gang drank and partied with the hostages. They all danced, sang songs, played games together and generally had a grand old time. Dan and Burn even got quite drunk, though Ned stayed sober. Except there was a snag. The train was very late because the report of Sherritt's murder took too long to come in. Ned gave in to his better nature and allowed a schoolmaster named Thomas Curnow to leave the hotel with his wife, child and sister, telling him to go straight to bed and not to dream too loud or he would shoot him. And this was one of Ned's biggest ever mistakes. Thomas, who Ned had released under the assumption that he was a sympathiser, ran straight to the cops at around 3am and told them all about the plan and the gang's location. This allowed a warning to be sent to the train, which greatly reduced its speed over the damaged section of the tracks, which prevented it from derailing. Meanwhile, Ned had decided to let the rest of the townsfolk leave because the train was taking too long and he wanted to stay in their good graces. However, the hotel's owner told everyone to stay so that they could listen to Ned speak. Imagine being such a chad that the people you just took hostage at gunpoint don't want to leave. And it's not even Stockholm Syndrome. They genuinely like you. <laughs> Unfortunately, Ned's speech was cut short when Byrne ran into the hotel informing Ned of the train's arrival. It was showtime. While the derailment plan may have been a bust and the gang had lost the element of surprise, there was one thing the police were not expecting. The outlaws knew that they were so outnumbered that the odds of avoiding every bullet was basically zero, but Ned had concocted a secret strategy, one that would become an iconic part of his legacy. His body armour. The armour was made from plough mouldboards and Ned was protected by a cylindrical headpiece, breast and back plates and an apron. The entire ensemble weighed about 97 pounds. Under the apron that kept his organs intact, he wore his prized green sash from his childhood. Despite having suited up, the gang had had very little sleep and half of them were also still pretty drunk. So their judgement would have been impaired and the Dutch courage would have provided them with a false sense of invulnerability. Also, the heavy armour limited the gang's movements and the ability to efficiently use their firearms. Under Superintendent Hare, the police laid siege to the hotel the gang were hiding in. It was make or break for the gang as they made their stand with a hail of bullets. Fifteen minutes into the gunfight, Ned was shot in the left elbow and in the right foot, so Dan, Burn, and Steve took refuge in the hotel while Ned snuck out the back door and into the nearby bush to flank the police as reinforcements arrived. 
and the women in the hotel made their escape from the battlefield. The rest of the gang covered Ned's exit with pot shots at the police to draw their attention, but unfortunately, this is where things go from bad to worse. During this massive gunfight, Byrne walked over to the bar in the hotel, poured himself a whiskey and made a toast saying, too many more years in the bush for the Kelly gang. Yeah, he kind of jinxed himself. A stray bullet caught him in the groin. The good news is that the bullet missed his crown jewels. But the bad news is that the bullet severed his femoral artery. Burn bled out and became the Kelly gang's first casualty. Shortly after Ned returned to the fight, emerging from the fog created by the gun smoke, looking like a demon his armour giving him a huge and imposing figure. Ned gave a rallying cry to his fellow outlaws and for 10 whole minutes, Ned advanced, bullets just bouncing off him while he's going pop, 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 watching cops drop, while laughing and taunting the police like a maniac. The police saw this coming towards them and they were absolutely terrified. The man was unstoppable, pausing only to change weapons. All the cops could do was keep shooting, but Ned was completely undeterred by their small arms fire, which only made inconsequential dents in his armour. Ned kept advancing, bullets were bouncing off him, and he just kept laughing like a madman while he fired back at the police. And then it happened. A cop named Sergeant Steele dove to the ground during this hail of bullets and he saw that Ned's legs weren't armoured. So he raised his shotgun and double tapped Ned, hitting him in the hip and the thigh. These blasts caused serious damage to Ned and he fell to the ground. Ned conceded defeat by saying, I'm done, I'm done. But the cheeky bastard didn't make it too easy for them. As Steele ran at Ned to disarm him, Ned fired a shot at Steele, blowing his hat off and burning the side of his face. The hotel siege continued until around 10 a.m. the following morning. The 30 remaining captives left the hotel after waving a white handkerchief out of the door and they were searched by the cops in case they were Kelly sympathisers or gang members and two of the captives were arrested for being sympathisers. However, some of the hostages were not so lucky. An old man named Cherry was found dead in a detached kitchen and had been fatally wounded by a police bullet. John Jones, who was the son of the hotel keeper, was found with a gunshot wound to the abdomen and later died in hospital. But now, with Ned captured and Byrne confirmed dead, only Dan and Steve were unaccounted for. But they were still somewhere inside the hotel. So the cops set the hotel on fire to try and smoke the two outlaws out. But the wind stoked the flames and the entire thing went up in an inferno. A priest named Father Matthew Gibney then went into the burning building to administer the last rites and he reported three dead bodies inside. Burns' body was brought out and propped up by the police who photographed it for the press. The other two bodies were those of Dan and Hart, who had apparently shot themselves to go out on their own terms. I mean, it's better than burning alive. The bodies were burned beyond recognition and were only identifiable by their sizes. This made Ned the only survivor of the Kelly gang. Ned was patched up by a doctor and stood trial in Melbourne on the 19th of October 1880 and in a mocking twist of fate he appeared before Sir Redmond Barry, the same judge that had sentenced his mother to three years in prison for the attempted murder of Fitzpatrick. 
The trial was adjourned to the 28th of October, where Ned was presented with the charges of murdering both constables Lonigan and Scanlon, though he managed to avoid being charged with the murder of Sergeant Kennedy. On top of all this, he was also charged with the various bank robberies and for the murder of Aaron Sherritt, and he was also charged with resisting arrest at Glenrowan and a long list of minor charges. So he was absolutely shafted. He was convicted of the willful murder of Lonigan and sentenced to death by hanging. After handing down the sentence, the judge concluded with the customary words, May God have mercy on your soul. To which Ned replied, I will go a little further than that and say, I will see you there where I go. Defiant to the end. Later on the 3rd of November, the Executive Council of Victoria decided that Ned Kelly was to be hanged eight days later on the 11th of November at the Old Melbourne Jail. In the week leading up to the execution, thousands of sympathisers turned out at street rallies across Melbourne demanding a reprieve for Ned Kelly. And on the 8th of November, a petition for clemency with over 32,000 signatures, some of which were of a suspicious nature, was presented to the Governor's private secretary. But, sadly, the desire to make an example out of Australia's most prolific criminal was worth more to the authorities than the good optics of having mercy on the folk hero. The Executive Council announced soon after that the hanging of Ned Kelly would go ahead anyway as planned. The day before his execution, Ned had his photographic portrait taken as a keepsake for his family, and he was granted a farewell meeting with his relatives. Ned's mother's characteristically tough-as-nails last words to him were reported to be, Mind, you die like a Kelly. At 10am the next morning, Ned's leg irons were removed, and after a short time, he was marched out to face the music. Having seen him into the world with his baptism, it was only appropriate that Charles O'Hay would see him out by giving him his last rites. It was reported that Ned was quiet on the way to the gallows, and when passing the prison flower beds, he remarked, what a nice little garden. Accounts of Ned's later meeting with the prison chaplain, Dean Donaghy, differ, as some newspapers and reporters wrote that Ned Kelly's last words were, such is life, while other newspapers recorded that this was his response to the governor when he informed Ned about the time of his execution. The Argus wrote that Ned Kelly's last words were, Ah well, I suppose it has come to this as the rope was being placed around his neck. After a short drop and a sudden stop, Ned Kelly's body was taken away to be buried in an unmarked mass grave. While the Kelly gang may have been defeated in the end, their crusade across the Australian bush wasn't in vain. As Ned had hoped, his death led to an investigation into police conduct which destroyed what was left of their reputation. While the cops exonerated themselves as far as their conduct with the Kellys was concerned, the investigation triggered a domino effect that led the investigators down a massive rabbit hole of corruption. One that completely destroyed the Chief Commissioner's career and got many cops demoted or fired. And for the following seven years, there was a real risk of copycat gangs emerging due to the root cause of rising tensions between the poor selectors and the rich squatters. Luckily, two police officers who had been involved in the Kelly gang pursuit had learned the right lessons and managed to prevent further violence by helping the selectors with their land disputes instead of just chucking the book at them when they were forced to turn to crime out of desperation. To this day, Ned Kelly is a very polarising figure. He is remembered by some as nothing more than a cold-blooded killer with delusions of grandeur on a ill-conceived revenge mission. 
However, others remember Ned Kelly as a working class folk hero for his defiance of the colonial authorities and his compassion towards the regular people that he came across. But what did Ned think? Well, he didn't really care too much about what other people thought about him. He is quoted as saying, I do not pretend that I have led a blameless life, or that one fault justifies another. But the public, in judging a case like mine, should remember that the darkest life may have a bright side. So basically, he wanted you to make your own mind up. As for me, I think it was a, a little bit from column A and a lot from column B. Yes, he and his family were persecuted by the state and Ned was mostly responding to the cops' escalation of the situation, but at the end of the day, he was still a petty criminal, even despite his lofty ambitions. Ultimately, however, the positive effect of his enduring legend and folk hero status among the downtrodden people he fought for is more important than anything else. He also deserves a lot of credit for the fact that he was very careful with picking his targets and treating almost everyone he came across with the respect that they deserved. And also for going the extra mile to make sure that not only were no hostages harmed, but that they actually kind of enjoyed the experience. If you want to take a look at some Australian history, Several of Ned's possessions remain on display at the State Library of Victoria in Melbourne, including his armour, his prized green sash, and some other smaller items. Naturally, the armour is probably the most iconic part of the Kelly Gang story, which actually worked extremely well despite the gang's ultimate defeat. Ned's armour has 18 dents in it from the bullets that it managed to stop, However, the force was still large enough to cause bruising, lacerations and a concussion when Ned was hit in the helmet. But for a bunch of outlaws in the 1800s, the armour's construction, which took between four and five months, was carried out astonishingly well. In fact, it was so good that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle said that the British army should be given something similar. And you know that you've struck gold when the mind that created Sherlock Holmes is praising your imagination. The reaction to the armour in police circles was rather mixed though. Blacksmiths ridiculed the announcement that the suits were made from plough mouldboards, saying that it was impossible. And it appeared the cops thought so too. It later turned out that informants had actually told the cops about the gang's plan to use this armour three times, and the cops just dismissed the idea three times because they thought it was impossible. Well, that's a lesson they learned the hard way. The old Melbourne jail, where Ned was executed, has since been converted into a museum, and it displayed what they believed at the time to be Ned Kelly's skull, until it was stolen by an unknown party in 1978, and it remains missing to this day. However, the rest of Ned's body was found in 2011 after sifting through 34 skeletons in the mass grave. The forensic team matched the DNA of the bones with the great-grandson of Ned's sister. The bones were returned to Ned's family in 2012 and on the 18th of January 2013, a funeral mass was held in his honour and his remains were buried at Greta Cemetery, near his mother's grave, a couple of days later. Press F in the chat, boys, and pay respects to the man, the myth, the legend, who did the impossible. Making police reform actually happen. Booyah! Right, done! That was a fucking long video, man. Jesus. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!